Welcome to another study of the Bible in its context with That the World May Know. The Bible is an absolutely fascinating book. God's great story reclaiming a broken world. One of the things that's amazing to me about that story is how often it intersects with the stories of other great cultures. Stand at the pyramids in Egypt and you discover the story was there. Come to Athens, the Parthenon, and the story came here too. It started in an unlikely way. God redeemed a group of slaves from Egypt and brought them to a desert mountain called Sinai. There, he commissioned them. He gave them a mission to be a kingdom of priests, a community of people who would put him on display by what they said and how they lived. He said, I will come and live among you, be present with you, and I want you to live a holy life so that you show them who I am and what I'm like. Sometimes they did really well, think David and Ruth, other times, not so well. Then God sent his son, also a Jewish man, who completed the task of redemption in his death and his resurrection and his ascension. And in the process, he called and trained a group of disciples, giving them the same mission Israel had always had. Be my witnesses. Let your light shine, hallow my name. And then he sent them out to the greater world to show in words and in actions who he was and what he had done in his son Jesus. One of those disciples was the Apostle Paul. Brilliant, trained in the book, passionate and intense, headed out to the Greco-Roman world to give them the news, a new king has come to mold and shape communities of priests who would put God on display. Unbelievable story, really. I want to invite you to join us. Discover unlikely people who believed that story. People who resisted it because they had another king. In it, you will find yourself challenged to become part of the story. So come with us. We're going to those great Greek cities of Philippi and Thessalonica, discovering with Paul that we're called to live, that the world may know who God is. This is a Bible. To a follower of Jesus like me, this book contains the inspired revelation of the creator of the universe. Contains good news. Gospel is the word we often use. The creator has begun the process of redeeming a broken world, restoring his lost children to the father's house. Behind me, a beautiful gate, a Roman gate in the city of Jerash in the modern country of Jordan, was built around 130 AD in honor of the Emperor Hadrian. In a way, it's a Bible too. In those niches were statues of Hadrian, who was called Lord and God. As Lord and God, he brought good news, gospel. In fact, they called it that. His good news is just beyond. It's amazing. Paved streets, running water, theaters, temples, a magnificent fountain, 
an unusual forum. There was a Jewish man, Paul we call him, his story is in this book too, who was commissioned to bring this good news to that world. He brought the good news to a place called Philippi. Be interesting to see what will be the reaction of the people of that world when they hear this good news. Join me. Let's follow Paul's sandal prints to the ancient city of Philippi. So look back up the road. I read there were more than 50,000 miles of paved road like this in the Roman Empire at its peak. Now this is an important road for our story here. We're in the Roman province of Macedonia, the modern country of Greece, but the ancient province of Macedonia and the road was called Via Ignatia, or Via Ignatia, as we say it in English. It ran 700 miles from the Adriatic, where it connected by sea to Italy itself, all the way to Neapolis, about 10 miles up this hill and around the corner. Paul came to the province of Macedonia on this road. Can you picture him? ready to carry that mission to those Gentiles, just as God had instructed Israel way back at Sinai, except he now had a new peace. He knew God more intimately than they had known him before because he had met his son. After he met Jesus, he went through some training and spent some time in the desert, and then he headed on his first teaching tour. On that teaching tour, he went to Galatia. Cities like Antioch, Lystra, Iconium, Derbe, and had varied success. He then headed back to, to Antioch of Syria, where he had come from. They then send him on his second teaching tour, and that's the one we're interested in and are engaging on this study. He goes first back through Galatia, takes his first real disciple, I like to say, Timothy. He wants to go to Asia. The Spirit of God won't let him. Doesn't say how, but wouldn't let him. Tries to go north into Bithynia. The Spirit of God wouldn't let him. So everywhere he tries to go, boom, the door is shut. And so he just keeps heading west until he came to Troas. At Troas, he has a vision of a man from Macedonia. The man said, we need help. Come and help us. And Paul took that as God's instruction that the next step was not north or south or Rome, but here in the Roman province of Macedonia. So Paul got on a boat at Troas in modern Turkey near the ancient city of Troy. Sails all day, night, stopped over at the island of Samothrace and then continued to Neapolis, about 10 miles that way on this road. From there, he and Silas and Luke and Timothy down the road to the first major city on this road. For you, I don't know what your man of Macedonia is. It may be right where you are your life's occupation, your life's calling. I don't know. I do know this. If that's where God has called you, the road is ready. You'll take care of that. You don't have to say, okay, God, I think you want me to go here. Get the road. That road was ready long before Paul. In fact, this road was actually paved after around 168 BC. So it had been in place already almost 200 years, 
maybe 200 years, maybe more than 200 years before Paul used it. And God said, ah, come on, Paul, it's in place. What do you think? I'm not going to be ready? So go to your Macedonia, whatever it is, whether it's where you are now or it's someplace new. So let's join Paul. Let's see once where he ended up as he headed then from Neapolis, where he got off the boat, to the first stop on the Via Egnatia. Come, let's go. There it is. After a 10 mile walk on the Via Ignatia, Paul arrived here. And below you, spread out beautifully, you see the ruins of that ancient city of Philippi. It takes up almost a whole chapter in the book of Acts, and he writes an entire book to the believers that will come to know Messiah in that city. I think it's just amazing to come and see that. We're on the Acropolis. Not much up here, but a stunning view nevertheless. If you look back towards east, you see more or less the route that the Via Ignatia would have taken. It runs through Philippi as Decumanus. Let me tell you the history of this place. Back way before Paul's time, people from the island of Thasos founded a settlement here called Crenides. But they were harassed by the local Thracian tribes. So in the 300s, mid 300s, they got in touch with a Macedonian king who was west of here a bit, whose name was Philip II. You know him as Alexander the Great's father and said, come on over and help us with this problem we've got. Philip gladly obliged and of course, not only came and helped them with the Thracians, but came and basically made the city his own. And either he or his son Alexander, I can find both in the records, changed the name to the city of Philip, Philippi. In 168, Rome finally took this as her own. Then comes one of the most significant moments in the history of the world, certainly in the history of the biblical world. In Rome, Rome was ruled by two consuls who served at the same time for one year. And then they would change. It was the Roman way to be a republic. So you didn't end up with a king or an emperor like their ancient tribal ancestors had had. Then Julius Caesar does the unthinkable. He wins a victory in Gaul and marches his army right into Rome and demands to be thought of as the king, the ruler. Maybe not called the king, but he basically takes power, realizing, as one author writes, you can have a republic or an empire, but you're not going to have both. And Julius apparently decides he prefers an empire to a republic. Now, there were some who said, no way. We're not going to allow our Constitution to go down the drain. We're going to remain a republic. 
So in March, March 15 of 44 BC, those Republic supporters assassinated Julius Caesar as the Senate met. And Julius was finished. They fled east, Cassius and Brutus, his assassins, and raised an army to come back to Rome to make sure that they remained a republic. Julius's adopted son, Octavian, and one of his greatest generals, Mark Anthony, raised an army in Rome and said, no, we will be an imperial empire. And they came marching east to face Cassius and Brutus. They met on the plain of drama. That battle will determine whether there is an imperial power and an emperor who calls himself the son of God with a gospel that says, I am the savior of the world at the time Jesus is born or whether it will still be a republic. If you look out in the valley, you see two small hills. Picture Mark Anthony camped on the left. More than 25,000 Romans. Octavian, who will be Augustus Caesar someday, on the right. Cassius is camped just out of the swamps down here on the left with a huge advantage of the city walls of Philippi. And Brutus at the foot of the hill with the defense of the hill and the city as well. There were two battles, one on October 3 of 42 BC. In that battle, Mark Anthony flanked Cassius and cut off his supply route. Cassius was so panicked that he committed suicide. And his part in the whole war ended. Brutus actually defeated Octavian, who ran for his life. The two sides retrenched, and on October 23, Brutus made a fatal mistake. He left the safety of the hill and the city walls and set out to attack his enemy. And he lost. He was given a proper burial and his head sent to Rome and placed at the foot of the statue of Julius Caesar in the Forum. And the world began to change. About 10 years later, 350 miles to the west at a place called Actium in 31 BC, Octavian and Anthony would face off, and you know the story, Octavian, who will be Caesar Augustus, won. Anthony fled to Egypt, and with his partner, his friend, Cleopatra, committed suicide as well, and Octavian is Lord and God. And the imperial climb to deification begins. His coins will say, savior of the world. His statues will say, the deified one. His gospel will say, peace, security has come. The golden age, as his writers will put it. And Caesar will be Lord and God. There's an altar in Rome called the Ara Pacha, the altar of peace. Scholars interpret the four panels to say, piety, let's get back to the gods of our founders. War, victory, and then Rome in peace. Caesar's way of bringing the good news of the kingdom of the Son of God, the Imperator means dominator or conqueror 
Augustus Caesar. And that road is the road Cassius and Brutus came on. That way, Octavian and Anthony, and they met here. And I like to picture those legions with their uniforms as the two meet and history decides that there will be a divine son of God on the throne when the Messiah, the son of the living God, arrives. So what happens when this Jew with his kingdom of God, kingdom of priests, tassels, comes walking on the Via Ignatia into a Roman colony where the Lord isn't king. Caesar is Lord and God. Let's go see. That's a good climb. We made that climb to the top of the Acropolis to discover the lengths that Octavian would go to to become Caesar, Caesar Augustus, Lord and God. Paul came to declare Jesus Lord and God, but the way Jesus came to authority and lordship was very different. There's a place in the ruins that I think illustrates clearly that difference. Let's go see. Here we have what's known as a heron. A little hard to tell exactly what was here. Uh, the church was built over it later and it obscured some of it, but it was built here, at least it was here in Paul's time. Do you know what a hero is in the Greek world? And I would have said before, sure, it's somebody who does great things. We've got heroes too. But it was much more than that in the Greek and Roman world. In their world, if somebody had accomplished what appeared to be superhuman things. Usually after their death, community would gather, talk about, decide what they had done that appeared superhuman. You know, the Abraham Lincolns of their day, I suppose. And then they would be honored because it was believed the gods had given them the gift of deification. Not that they became the eternal gods, that's different, but they were deified. After death, they were given some of the privileges and powers of gods. People like Ulysses and Hercules and Asclepius and Perseus and Alexander the Great, for that matter. In some ways, that was what was being done for Caesar even while he was still alive. And they would build a structure then, a small temple, and you can see the steps of that here. And they would gather here to honor and venerate and worship that particular hero. I don't think they thought those heroes could really do anything. Some of their divine powers might rub off a little bit, but rather they might have influence with the gods themselves. At least that's how I read it, what they were doing here. And so a heron is a place where you honor somebody that accomplished during their lifetime what was necessary to be deified. Now notice how well that fits that system that you live your life to put yourself on the top of the heap. And if it means using others, now this one they think is probably Philip II's Heron. Now that's, that's important because Philip II wasn't just Philip II. That's Alexander the Great's father and a powerful, powerful king in his own right who was seeking deification already in his own lifetime. In fact, he was at his daughter's wedding 
and there were 12 statues brought in of the 12 main Olympian gods, and then a statue number 13 of Philip. And as that statue was brought in, he was struck down by a couple of his bodyguards. So even at the end of his life, he's still trying to position himself on the top, using others to reach the top. And I just see a structure like this as being a classic monument to people who will use others for their own benefit to make themselves the top of the heap. Now imagine we get that inspired email well, they didn't have email, but that inspired letter from Paul. Listen to what he writes to the city of Heron. That is, listen to what he writes to Philippi where the Heron of Philip was. Famous Heron. Your attitude, your mind, ought to be the same as that of Christ Jesus. That's a high bar who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being found in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Now I don't know about you, but I think there's some real irony in that because that is absolutely a heron turned upside down. That flips the script. That's absolutely backwards. In their world, a hero is somebody who's trying to reach the top of the heap, climbing over everyone else in the process. In Jesus' case, it's someone who has the very nature of God, but empties himself of some use of those divine powers in order to become a humble servant and give himself a sacrifice for others. And that, I would like to suggest, is how the kingdom of the Heavenly Father comes. It's a power too, a power to transform culture as well as transform the lives, the hearts, the minds of individuals. But notice Paul says, your mind, your attitude ought to be like that. So Paul came here to say, I'm going to tell you about Lord and God, Jesus the Messiah. But the way that empire, that kingdom works, is exactly the opposite of what your world considers normal. So the model for us, not the heroin, but the life and attitude of Jesus. Are you ready to be part of that kingdom? Are you ready to humble yourself as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, showing the world what it looks like when heaven's practices begin here, at least in some way? It will mean sacrificing yourself, taking up your cross for others. Come.